Thank you. Um, this was a tough movie when I was asked to talk about it, to think about how not to spoil major pieces of the film uh, while introducing the science of it, so I'm gonna do my best. Uh, for those who have seen Phantom Thread, you might think it's not an obvious example of science on screen. It takes place in London and the English countryside in the 1950s, focusing principally on a dressmaker. Uh, but alongside the beautiful costumes, I think it's also a movie about the relationship between nature and artifice, eating and creating, dominance and care, death and rebirth, and a lot of that comes out through mushrooms. So at a certain point in the film, I won't ruin it, but you will see a character open up this book, Edible and Poisonous Mushrooms, What to Eat and What to Avoid, by Mordecai Cubit Cook. Uh, and in this short introduction, I want to give you some background on this book and on edible mushrooms during the period uh, that the film takes place in. Hopefully by the end, you'll, you'll be primed to notice some interesting connections throughout between food and drink, flowers and mushrooms, all that good stuff. But first, a little bit about mushrooms and what makes them poisonous. So for centuries, there have been debates about which mushrooms are poisonous and which ones are not. In the past, these discussions typically concerned differentiating the safe mushrooms from the dangerous toadstools. Uh, the example shown here, which is an Amanita muscaria, or a fly agaric mushroom, some of the most famously poisonous mushrooms, but they also are known to trigger a mild hallucinogenic experience if you eat a little bit of them. Uh, today, we generally use the word mushroom to describe the, any of the kind of fruiting bodies, poisonous or not, that are produced by fungi. Uh, these fruiting bodies are not the fungus itself, but they're its reproductive organs. They disperse spores to the surrounding area. That's how the fungus reproduces. But not all fungi produce uh, mushrooms. There are about 150,000 identified species of fungi in the world, many of which do not reproduce via mushrooms, things like yeast, rust, that sort of stuff. Uh, but scientists also estimate that there might be as many as two million total sort of species of fungi in the world, which means that the vast majority of fungal life is, is all but unknown to the scientific world. Uh, if you're interested in reading a little bit more about that, this is my only uh, personal plug. Uh, I just wrote an article about this that's available for free uh, on a website called Pioneer Works Broadcast, and uh, you can check it out. But uh, we now know that a group of toxic compounds, which are called amatoxins, uh, and are found in a number of genera of fungi, are responsible for the vast majority of cases of mushroom poisoning. So the diagram you're looking at is the amatoxin family, and each of those little red R's uh, designates a different compound. Uh, amatoxins, in a very simple sense, inhibit the synthesis of messenger RNA. They travel quickly through the bloodstream. They cause your liver or your heart to suddenly stop working, and they cause you to be dead. <laughs> they are um, remarkably potent, really incredible, actually, compounds in the sense that only a very small amount of this is necessary to kill a human being. So as a result, one of the most dangerous mushrooms in the entire world is this very innocuous and dull-looking uh, white mushroom called Amanita phalloides. Uh, its nickname kind of gives away its peril. It's known as the death cap. Uh, so if you see one of these in the woods, I cannot emphasize enough, do not eat it. There are also some little puffball mushrooms that look like this one, so it's, it's best to just steer clear. Uh, but if you're a mystery writer, like maybe a cool plot point, I don't know. Um, another really dangerous mushroom, which may or may not be in the movie, is a mushroom that's known as the jack-o'-lantern mushroom. Uh, in part, it's dangerous because it looks deceptively similar to a chanterelle mushroom. Uh, these jack-o'-lantern mushrooms contain a mild toxin that's known as illudin, which is not going to kill you probably, but it is going to give you a horrible day and some serious st uh, stomach uh, pain. A cool thing that's kind of beside the point, though, is jack-o'-lanterns also contain a compound called luciferin, which causes their gills to glow in the dark when, uh, like fireflies, it's the same chemical process. Uh, and the name jack-o'-lantern probably emerged because people walking through the woods in England and America sort of saw these fairy-like glows in the nighttime. Uh, all the bioluminescent species are toxic, or most of them are, so if you see a glowing mushroom, again, don't eat it. 
Um, so many mushrooms can be toxic or nauseating. Uh, children are particularly at risk for mushroom poisoning. Uh, but there are also really interesting and well-documented cases of adults eating the same mushroom and having dramatically different responses to it. So there's a lot that we just don't understand about how mushroom poisoning works. Some people can eat something without any problems. Other people will, will have serious uh, allergic reactions. So, so that's kind of the view from the present, but to go back in time a little bit to the period in which Phantom Thread takes place, uh, the picture was very different, and I want to share a little bit of that history. So one of the earliest popular English language guides to edible mushrooms was written by the British physician and naturalist Charles Batham in 1847. Uh, Badham had done a little tour of continental Europe, he went to Italy, he went to France, and he was blown away by all the awesome mushrooms that you could get at local markets. So Badham said, I should bring this back to England, where nobody really eats mushrooms, and many working class people were struggling to find food. This was right after the sort of Irish potato famine, so free food in the woods is, is very much in demand. Uh, and as Badham noted, quote, uh, no country is perhaps richer in esculent funguses than our own. No markets might therefore be better supplied than the English. And yet England is the only country in Europe where there is important and savory food is from ignorance or prejudice left to perish ungathered. So Badham's guide included these diagrams which were intended to help individuals sort of identify edible versus poisonous fungi. At the top left, what you're seeing is different colored spore prints, which are a useful tool for identifying a mushroom even today. Uh, to produce one of these, you, you get the mushroom, cut off the cap, put it on a piece of paper, and then wait, and it will drop its spores on the paper. The spores have come in all these various different colors. They're key to identifying a species. But unfortunately, in the decades that followed, uh, Badham's grand vision of, of British uh, folks walking through the woods collecting mushrooms didn't quite pan out. Uh, but nevertheless, newspapers carried quite a few stories of mushroom poisonings, which supported a kind of broader sense in England that mushrooms were dangerous and, and worth avoiding. This is a series of short articles from the Newcastle Daily Chronicle in 1886, and it, it shows that distinguishing safe from dangerous mushrooms was a topic of widespread interest, uh, and yet remained sort of quite confusing for many people. Uh, the same was the case apparently in France, where a lot of concern about uh, eating dangerous mushrooms existed, but in a very French way, this uh, newspaper article from uh, Le Petit Parisien uh, proclaimed in 1912 that actually, quote, it's easy to distinguish the dangerous mushrooms. <laughs> it's, it's not. So, so by the end of the 19th century, um, the botanist Mordecai Cubitt Cook, who I mentioned at the start, uh, had witnessed a mild increase in the popularity of mycology, the science of fungi, uh, in Great Britain and ev elsewhere around the world. And in particular, uh, he had witnessed the growth of a kind of weekend pastime, the, the mushroom hunt, or known as a fungus foray. Uh, this had become popular, and it was a gathering that kind of brought together professional scientists, semi-professional botanists, and just amateurs who were interested in learning about mushrooms. And in a sense, these, these little gatherings are an early example of what we would today call uh, citizen science. And they helped to popularize the idea that actually a regular person could go out into the forest and identify a mushroom for themselves. So in order to support this, Cook wrote Edible and Poisonous Mushrooms, which was first published in 1894. It was released again a number of years later. It was kind of a popular little book. Um, and it was written with amateurs in mind. Uh, so he hoped to make it possible for those who were interested in mushrooms to, to make these dis dis distinguishments uh, between safe and poisonous. As he explained himself, Quote, there was a time within the memory of man still living when the majority of indigenous fungi were regarded as toadstools and affirmed to be poisonous. But, he continued, this has been shown to be a fallacy, and now they are admitted to be only a minority. And Cook thought that as people studied, as they collected, they would learn that actually all these ones that seemed dangerous were, were not that dangerous after all. 
Um, one of the things that made Cook's book so interesting to people was a series of detailed colored plates that appeared throughout the text and made it easier for amateurs to identify one mushroom from another than the kind of colorless diagrams that had appeared in Badham's book. So these are much more sort of alive than, than what you would have gotten in earlier texts, and they were combined with descriptive analysis of the mushrooms. This book was one of actually many sort of edible mushroom guides that came out around this same time. Uh, over on, on our side of the pond, we, we got Charles McIlvain instead, who published uh, 1,000 American fungi in 1900, so he was really going for it. Um, like, like Cook, McIlvain was, was writing in the face of a sort of historic Anglo-American mycophobia. Uh, we are people in, in this country, in England, who traditionally avoided eating mushrooms. Uh, but McIlvain is also interesting because he appeared somewhat distinctly uh, hardy of stomach. He would go on to defend the edibility of hundreds of mushrooms that we now consider poisonous. Um, and this earned him the nickname, Old Iron Guts. <laughs> so uh, Old Iron Guts also included a bunch of these beautiful colored plates in his guide, like the one you see here. And uh, you'll notice that in a lot of these, they show the mushroom in kind of a full view and like a cutoff view, so that you can see both the kind of fully developed version and then a kind of like gill side or, or inside display, which is often key. Especially there's a false chanterelle and a real chanterelle. They look very similar on the outside, different on the inside. Okay, so that gives you a little bit of sense of the, the science and the collecting, but um, I also want to say a few words about eating and cooking mushrooms. Uh, one basic point is that virtually all wild mushrooms have to be cooked thoroughly before eating. You do not want to eat them raw. One of the few exceptions is this fungus, known as the beefsteak fungus, uh, Fistulina hepatica, which is often eaten raw in salads as a kind of beef alternative. Um, but, but cooking is an important part of this scientific story in a way that many people don't realize. Uh, and so in McIlvain's book, along with his 1,000 edible fungi, he also gave credit for a bunch of mushroom cooking recipes that he included to two women, uh, Emma Ewing and Sarah Rohrer. Uh, this was commonplace in mycological texts of this period, that actually women were the only ones who knew how to cook mushrooms, and so the male mycologists would have to rely on these women to kind of provide uh, recipes. Uh, Sarah Rohrer was the founder of the Philadelphia School of Cookery and a popular newspaper columnist. And although not actually a vegetarian herself, she provided many of the early sort of vegetarian recipe suggestions in her books and helped popularize the idea that the mushroom is sort of like a vegetarian alternative to meat. Uh, and it's worth remembering as well that in, until the mid-1960s, uh, mushrooms were considered members of the plant kingdom. So these were all still thought of as plants. Now, during the Second World War, which is just a few years before sort of the events in Phantom Thread take place, the wartime committee in the UK debated the need to increase the production of yeast-based fungal spreads to alleviate pressures on the food supply. So these kind of yeast spreads were a, a way of solving food shortages. And uh, as many of you may know, uh, Marmite, which is one example of these savory yeast extracts, became especially popular in the UK during the First and, and Second World Wars. So, so fungal foods were kind of all over the place, both in terms of wild mushrooms, these extracts that were prepared ahead of time. Uh, although many of us uh, lucky enough to experience British cuisine at its finest will know uh, that sautéed mushrooms are also a key part of the full English breakfast, um, but they actually didn't really join the full English breakfast until the mid-1900s. So earlier, the, the mushroom was, would have been considered quite a crazy thing to put together with your eggs and beans and bangers, whatever. Uh, um, and so to return uh, to end up with kind of more conventional mushroom cooking, uh, as, as Mordecai Cook noted in his book, culinary work with mushrooms was no simple task. He explained that there is an art in it which makes all the difference. And frankly, the ordinary domestic cook without special experience never succeeds well enough with the common mushroom. It requires a kitchen genius to present them at their best. Uh, you'll see some of that in the movie. 
Um, and uh, Cook offer, uh, offered one further piece of advice which remains common to this day but has a kind of special meaning in relation to phantom thread. Um, he insisted that one should only eat a small piece of mushroom at a time and, and if you're learning a new species, you know, just try a little bit out and experiment. As he wrote, quote, punishment will follow inordinate indulgence in any of the good things in this life. And those who disregard reason and are intemperate in eating fungi must expect to suffer. I can't say any more without ruining the movie, but thank you all so much. Hope you enjoy. Thank you.